Uh, as a preliminary matter, my name is Charlie Foskett, Chair of the Finance Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please indicate that you are present. Um, Grant Gibbian? Present. Shane Blundell? Here. John Ellis? Here. Nakaya Healy? Here. Mary Margaret? I'm here. Ari Padaria? Present. Jonathan Wallach? Here. Brian Beck? Here. Peter Howard? Here. Jaylene Crawford? Oh, uh, Here. Sorry. Here. Let's take that middle name out of there. Uh, Daryl Farmer? Here. Uh, John Dice? Alan Jones? Here. Andy LaCourt? Here. Bill Keller? Present. Al Tosti? Here. George Kosher? Here. Christine Deschler? Here. Dean Carmen? Here. And David McKenna? Here. Thank you. John uh, Dice just came in. John Dice is in here. Okay. So, uh, we have 21 members. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, going on with this agenda. Uh, so we have uh, Liz Diggins, you're here? Yes, I am. Um, we have anticipated speakers tonight, um, Sandy Pooler in the beginning, and then we have some uh, members of the school uh, committee and the Arlington Public Schools, whose names I will uh, recite uh, when they're here. Um, <clears throat> this open meeting, the Arlington Finance Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency uh, due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirements of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public bodies, or public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely. So long as public, reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure par public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment only in writing by email to ediggins at town.arlington.ma.us.com. For this meeting, we're convening by a Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join and comment. Please note the meeting's being recorded and some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials have been provided to, provided to this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. Um, the chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda, and uh, after the concluding remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold your uh, comments until your name is called. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking, and please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair. Um, I think this covers the important points of this document. So we'll move to the first item on the agenda. Thank you very much. The first item on the agenda is minutes. Peter Howard. Thank you, Charlie. Um, the minutes were distributed last week. Um, I got, got uh, quite a few inputs. Um, revised them uh, last week, uh, last uh, yesterday. And I got several um, corrections, distribute them again with the corrections highlighted. And uh, I got a few more from Charlie, from uh, Alf Hosty, <coughs> which were largely readability issues. Uh, I moved that the uh, minutes of the 29th be accepted. Second. So it's been moved and seconded. Uh, I don't know if I'm looking at the most recent version, uh, Peter, but um, I did want to ask uh, on the uh, discussion of the letter to uh, uh, Deputy Manager, Deputy Town Manager Cooler, I was going to suggest changing the word disapproval to comment commentary. 
under Article 10, 43, 43 ADUs. You like commentary? I do. So do I. So done. Thank you. And then uh, Shane Blundell's name was misspelled. Article 9, under on the, on the point 9, you had B-L-N-O and D-E-L-L. -L. And, um, and there was an extra, and in Article 8, there was an, an S in front of action, no action. That's, that's been fixed. Okay, good. So it's been moved and seconded. Any further questions or comments? Uh, Charlie, could you say again, what's the word you like rather than disapprove? Commentary. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, this is Micaiah. Uh, my, my last name is spelled incorrectly. I know I have a lot of vowels in my, my name. Okay. Um, under the first, number one introduction, um, it should be H-E-A-L-Y. Oh, there's no E? No E. Uh-oh. I've been making that mistake, too. Oh, I did that mistake. That's my mistake. I, I apologize, Makai. Okay, there's a lot of vowels. Yeah. Could, could you say that again, please? H-E-A-L-Y. <laughs> H-E-A-L-Y. Yes. And that's, I, I think I have been misspelling that throughout the document, so I'll have to go back and fix that. So I apologize, Makai. I don't think you have. I think it's been correct. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's moved and seconded. Any, any further comments? Okay, we'll vote on the minutes. Grant Gibbion? Aye. Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Kaya Healy? Yes. Mary Margaret Franklin? Yes. Uh, Arif? Yes. Jonathan Wallach? Yes. Brian Beck? Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Sh uh, Shailene Brokers. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Yes. Undiced. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Andy LaCourt. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Al Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler, Dean Carmen. Yes. yes. Pardon? Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Did I get you, Christine? I voted yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, the minutes are passed as modified uh, unanimously. Thank you. Okay, so the first item on the agenda. Um, well, I wanted to mention that um, there are a couple of budgets that we have to do. We may capture some of them tonight. And then um, I also wanted to mention uh, that we'll try to finish the Warren articles and remaining budgets on Monday. And I'd also like uh, to see if we can get a report from each of the three working groups uh, on Monday night, maybe uh, five or 10 minutes just on the status of where things are. Um, so Deputy Town Manager Sandy Pooler is here with us uh, the, to report on some collective bargaining progress and uh, the impact on two budgets. Sandy? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, we are uh, in a process of finishing off one set of uh, collective bargaining agreements and moving to the next set. Um, we have a police uh, budget here that covers the contract period of FY19, 20, and 21. Um, it was the last contract of the six town contracts that had yet to be settled. All other uh, unions settled their contracts a, a couple of years ago, but the police patrol union decided that it wanted to go to through an arbitration process. Um, and it had uh, some very, I would say, extravagant asks. And I think they hoped that the arbitration panel would give them some of the things they were asking for. Um, we negotiated for a couple of years, uh, then went into an arbitration uh, process uh, uh, about a year ago, and it took until this February to finally get a decision from the arbitration panel. This panel, uh, it is binding on me to recommend the uh, settlement to you, uh, to ask you for a favorable vote. And I will also say it is my personal opinion uh, that this is a good settlement for the town. And I will explain the finances and a little bit about what's in the settlement. Um, 
you have in front of you a memo from me. I did a revised salary page for the police department that um, puts the changes that are reflected in this uh, arbitration award in, uh, and then a revised uh, total budget uh, for the police department, revised salary pages just for the patrol union. I did not recreate new uh, salary pages for the other uh, ranking officers or civilians because those have not changed. Again, this is finishing the last of the business from our FY19 to FY21 contracts. Um, during that period, we had set out an overall pattern with our all of our town unions, essentially of a three, two, one COLA. Um, and then with the um, public safety unions, we added about another half percent to that as what we thought of as sort of the cost of giving them raises and having them not go to the JLMC and go to arbitration. Every town union then settled on essentially a pattern of a 221 plus other components to their settlements that put money in other places. Um, and that, in fact, is the pattern that you see here in this arbitration award. So it is a COLA pattern of 2% in FY19, 2% in FY20, and 1% in FY21. The other significant thing that happened in this arbitration award is that this union was given two new steps. Um, each step is worth 1% uh, above the step below it. That is the same pattern that the ranking officers have. Um, they have um, six steps now, and each one is worth 1%. Um, the issue of steps was a significant issue for this union. They've been for years been thinking that they were falling behind other cities and towns because we would never give them steps. And one of the reasons we would never give them steps is that there is a provision in the ranking officers, in other words, the sergeants, lieutenants, and captains contract that says that their pay is based on a percentage above patrol officers pay. We have argued for many years that that's an illegal provision in the ranking officer's contract. But because we were always worried that if we gave the patrol officers more steps, the ranking officers would immediately go up. During the arbitration, uh, this issue came to the fore and um, the lawyer representing the patrol officers also happens to represent the ranking officers. And during arbitration, he said he did not think that that provision was valid anymore and that they were not going to try to enforce it. So we eventually got uh, the ranking officers to sign a memorandum of agreement, taking it out of their contract. That opened the door for us to be able to give steps to patrol officers. Now, I went through that long history to tell you all that because um, I think these new steps for the patrol officers, uh, they fall within our uh, pattern, our economic pattern, but they give them something that they've been looking for for a long time. And in that regard, I think they're important to include in this contract. Um, so that's why I'm supportive of it. Um, there, there was also a change in how we give pay, what used to be called Quinbill pay. Uh, we used to have the Quinbill here in Arlington. Um, when the state stopped funding it, we changed the provisions of the Quinbill. And we had a system whereby officers who had criminal justice degrees or master's degrees or law degrees, um, in their first, uh, they would have to wait five years before they got any Quinbill payment. Then they got half of whatever the regular Quinn bill payment was until they got to eight years, and then they went to full Quinn. The union had asked that they all get full Quinn from day one. We opposed that. And the arbitration panel said that uh, new officers being hired will get half Quinn for the, uh, immediately uh, if they have those degrees, 
and have to wait five years before they get to full Quinn. Um, we, uh, and we, we, we're fine with that. There are other provisions that are non-monetary that I mentioned in the memo, which I won't go into unless there are questions, but there are all things that the town asked for, which we think are favorable to us in terms of managing um, overtime, managing sick leave, and managing comp time. And we're very happy that the panel gave us those things. They also rejected other requests from the union uh, to give way more vacation days than the union currently gets and some other things that they were looking for. Um, I have to say that overall financially, uh, this is about $20,000 cheaper than what we had informally put on the table to the union. Um, so the union should have taken our informal deal, but they didn't. They went forward with arbitration fully and uh, this is what the panel gave them. So we think financially it fits within the pattern and it does give us um, some ability to move forward on, um, on controlling things like, uh, as I say, uh, comp time and vacation. Um, I I'm gonna move quickly to the library contract because it's short and quick and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, <coughs> Library contract is uh, relative to the new fiscal year, FY22. So whereas the police contract, uh, this, this settlement covers the old period, um, what I presented to you under police is, the new, is a new contract number for FY22, just carrying over this award. The library, on the other hand, with our professional library association, we have negotiated a one-year contract with them with a one and a half percent COLA and uh, an increase in $300 for each step on their longevity scale. We have longevity, so after five or 10 or 15 years, people get a longevity payment. Um, and the uh, library union wanted to increase those steps rather than get the one and a half percent COLA that we put on the table for everybody else. We have always said to our unions, we are willing to move the money around in different places as long as at the end of the day, it costs the same. We also in their contract rec recognize Juneteenth um, and gives them a floating holiday, um, which they have to use um, before the end of the calendar year, year each year. The, there is a copy of that agreement at the back of um, the packet I sent you. It is unsigned at this point, although uh, late today I did get a signed copy from the union. We just need the, the manager to sign it. It has been ratified by the union. Um, finally, I'd just like to say the cost of each of these things, the police department budget needs to go up by $221,027. And the library uh, budget needs to go up by 32,787. To increase those budgets for FY22, we would ask that you also decrease the salary reserve account that we put in the manager's budget by $253,994. Uh, so in other words, we're increasing departmental budgets and we'll decrease the salary reserve that we set aside. Um, uh, at some point, we will come back. I will come back to you, I hope, with other union contracts for the FY22 and also with an exact number for a retro payment um, for the police contract. All that will come under Article 61, which is the collective bargaining um, provision. Um, but uh, I don't know for sure if we will have other settlements before town meeting. We certainly encourage the unions to, to do that. Um, and some of them are moving forward and some of them are stuck, I will have to say. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. You're muted, Charlie. Jonathan Wallach. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Um, um, 
Just a couple of questions. So if I understand what you're saying, the um, fiscal 22 number for the police for salaries reflects the cumulative amount um, for what they're getting paid as a result of the arbitration. And then at some point, when you negotiate a new salary going forward, we're gonna then increase that number. Um, if, if in fact you, you um, settle on something prior to this budget being set. That's um, correct. Um, and then next year for fiscal 23, we'll remove the cumulative amount that's, that's in the fiscal year 22 budget for this arbitration and, and then just have whatever the amount is going forward for the negotiated contract. Uh, that, am I so, getting that right? So in terms of removing, if in the packet, I gave you a salary sheet, which I know you can't read, but you know it looks like this. This shows under the arbitration where everybody who's a patrol officer will be paid uh, in FY22. So whatever steps they are gonna get or anything else, or they got reassigned or um, so forth and so on. So that is gonna be the base of the FY22 budget. Um, it will be adjusted at some point, reflecting a new collective bargaining agreement for FY22. And once we have that, you will get a new, brand new sheet that will reflect that collective bargaining settlement and in reflected as to what the total police budget should be. Right, but if I understand you correctly, the, the fiscal year 22 number reflects, in essence, back pay for 20 and 21. No, the retro pay is not part of what we are here talking about today. Oh, okay, fine. Thank you. So I misunderstood. Thank you very much. Any other questions on either the police or the library? So I, I would just like to uh, confirm. I think Arif has his hand up. Uh, who does? Arif. Oh, maybe he, oh, Arif. Sorry, I'm looking at the little, uh, Partition. I raised the hand now. I couldn't raise, I couldn't find the hand. It <laughs> found okay, sorry. Go I'm just, just a quick question, Sandy. It, this, I am also looking at the sal salary detail. I have it in front of me. I'm trying to understand something. So in FY22, there's a min and a max for the salaries, right? So if yeah. I look at that one, say, for example, I just take random. Let's just take the first line, 54, 639 and 60,094. And now if you go to the right and you look at the base of FY 20, 2022, the base is 63,147, let's say for the first person, Bartholomew. Yes. yes and then I you go all the saying. way to the end at 68. But that base does not fall between the min and the max. So what is the differential there? <laughs> that's, that's my failing to update the min and the max in this giant spreadsheet. <laughs> Uh, and in fact, so the, the min uh, is going to be uh, what we have for uh, the vacant positions are about three quarters of the way down. So it's 57,415. That is the new min. Uh, and the max uh, for a patrol officer at this point will be 64,416. Uh, so I just, in my speed to get this thing done, which I sent out about 4.30 this afternoon. I just didn't think about updating the min and the max. I can send a revised sheet that has that. Um, they're all linked together, but that's a good catch, Arif. I just didn't update it. Oh, okay, thank you for the explanation. Thank, thank you for the question. Any other questions? So, so, um... Sandy, I have a, a question just to confirm that um, that th these funds are in the manager's reserve account. We're moving this money out of the manager's reserve account into the police and or library. And the total budget in the that we are dealing with doesn't change here, right? 
That's words, right. These have been reserved for, so it's in the budget, and we're just moving the numbers around in different departments. It's, it's essentially a transfer or, or reallocate, just making a better, more accurate budget before it goes to town meeting. Okay. And uh, Jonathan or Daryl, do you have any comments? Uh, anything, any concerns? Uh, I, I do not. Okay. Jonathan's shaking his head. I don't think. No, that nor do I. How are you, you feeling, Jonathan? Are you hanging in there? Foggy. <laughs> Achy. Okay. So, uh, so let's take the uh, police budget first. Um, Daryl or Jonathan, do you want to make a motion that's on that? Um, uh, yeah. I, I move that we approve the increase of the police budget by what was it, 221,000? Oh, twenty seven dollars Yeah. Is there a second? Second. Um, are there any further questions or comments on the uh, police, uh, the change to the police budget? Yes. Peter. 229, what? Uh, what? What's the number? Uh, 221,027. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, uh, Grant Gibbion? Aye. Jane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Makaya Healy? Yes. Uh, Mary Margaret? Yes. Arif Padaria? Aye. Jonathan Wallach? Yes. Brian Beck? Yes. Peter Howard? Yes. Sh uh, Shailene Pokers? Abstain. Uh, Daryl Harmer? Yes. Uh, John Dice? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. Danny LaCourt? Yes. Uh, Bill Keller? Yes. Al Tosti? Al Tosti? Yes. Uh, George Koser? Yes. Christine Deschler? Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Uh, so that would be uh, 20 in favor, or let's say 19 in favor, one abstention, that with the with the uh, chairman not voting. Thank you very much. So let's move on to uh, the library uh, budget, and. Um, Mary Margaret, would you uh, like to make the motion on the library budget? Sure. Um, I suggest we um, approve the 32,787 needed. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you. Any further questions on the library uh, proposal? Hearing, um, actually, I'm not looking at the screen, so I'm just going to say hearing none, but I, let me just check and make sure. Peter Howard, yep, okay, his hands down. No further questions. Grant Gibbion. Yes. Shane Blundell. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Kaya Healy. Yes. Mary Margaret. Yes. Marie Padaria. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Shailene Pokers. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Yes. John Dice. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Andy LaCourt. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Alan Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Vote unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add this evening? Um, no, I just want to thank the committee very much for your support. Uh, these are very important agreements. Um, that we have with our staff, and we appreciate your support moving them forward. I'd, Mr. Chair, if there's any other questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I would thank you for your time. I don't see any other questions. Thank you for your time, and, and uh, thanks to the management for their uh, dedicated uh, work in resolving these complicated negotiations. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Nice thank you. Thanks. It's 8.02. We have uh, 13 minutes until the uh, school department will be here in force. So, um, Micaiah, 
would you like to take the human resources budget up? Sure, I'll try to speak fast as a newbie, but um, if you can pull up the uh, HR budget, I'll share it also on my screen. So, Makaya, you've muted yourself. Here we are. Okay. Okay, got it. Good. You got it. Good. All right. Um, so, uh, if you want to feel the paper in between your hands, uh, I'm on page 29 um, of the human resources budget. Uh, so, we'll do this very quickly because it's easy. Um, <laughs> And as you can see, there aren't any changes from the year before. I think you're in the wrong page. Oh, uh, okay. Here we go. There you go. Okay. All right, here we go. All right. So uh, as you can see, there aren't any changes uh, to the budget. Actually, I can. Uh, salaries and wages are, um, are, have remained the same. They're they, they're at their max um, at this point. Um, and hold on a second. Let me just get my notes. Could you see my notes when I started sharing? Yes. <laughs> did you did you see the note that said breathe? Yeah, and you're, you did, and you're great. Don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's on the recording. I know. That's that's going to be great. Hopefully it gets deleted soon. So, um, so everyone is at their max. Uh, and, uh, and so, yes, I just want to take a look down here. Yes, there is um, a $50,000 amount for training. Um, and the reason that we see that is because, you know, in different years, there are different number of people, obviously. And so that conference number keeps changing. Um, we asked, what does $50,000 pay for? Um, what is that used for? And $30,000 uh, went to pay for training with the National League of Cities. Um, and $20,000 is for training, hiring, um, promotional processes associated with public safety. Um, so let's see. And I can go more into detail about the assessment processes, uh, but I don't think that it's necessarily, there's a lot of promotional components um, that they do for uh, the, the fleet public service divisions like police and fire. Uh, um, feel free to interrupt too if I'm like stuttering or not saying the right things. No, it's fine. Okay. Go right ahead. Uh, $3,700, $3, let's see, is for under, under other purchases. Here we are right here. Uh, and that was to cover ancillary um, costs like shredding services or pre-employment physicals, um, drug screens for employees uh, and advertising. And let's see, if we take a look at longevity uh, number on the first page, and then we flip to the salary side on this side. Um, hard to see, but let me zoom in a little bit. I, might, I, I always squint. I think I need glasses, um, but the it, it's basically the same. Where is the seventy five hundred? It's here. Here it is. That doesn't seem to add up. Seven seven five five. Let me go back up. Where's yeah, that's what's up there. Seven seven. Oh, great, perfect. Okay, so I just typed it incorrectly in my notes. Okay. So it's the same. Um, the offsets are from water and sewer, um, and someone else someone else manages the offsets and the percentages, as you all know. But um, what I learned. Um, how much have they spent so far this year? Um, I asked, and they said that they will be within budget. Um, so that's great. And let's see. Do we have any questions at this point? Any questions from Akaya on the? Human resources budget. 
I don't see any hands up. Okay. So there are no hands up. So Makai, uh, do you want to make a motion for that budget at this point? Sure, yes. I'd like to make the motion to approve the budget as it is printed. Second. Okay. So it's moved and seconded for uh, Makai, I just lost. Um, the budget page. Can you read the number, please? The, uh, the bottom line. 364. For, um, do I go down here? One more page? Or is this, or, or, uh, I go up, right? 364696. Six. Sorry. 364696, six, right. So it's been moved and seconded for $364,696. Are there any, any other questions for Micaiah on uh, the human resources uh, budget? No okay. question, but one comment. Good job for what for being on the committee for one day. <laughs> yes, I totally, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Great. Really good. Second. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll see if she gets unanimous votes. That's going to be another test. Okay. Um, human resources budget, Grant Gibbon. Aye. Shane Blundell. Yes. John. Yes. Kaya. Yes. Mary Margaret. Yes. Arif. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter. Oh. Uh, Shailene. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Yes. John Deist. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Al Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. So um, it's a unanimous vote on the uh, human resources budget and uh, great job on the first night. We're not done yet, of course. There's still some more opportunities, but. Um, hit it out of the park. Hit it out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so <clears throat> is Jane Morgan here yet? Is that, I can't see here. I sure am. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Jane, is the school department ready to uh, move forward? I, I'm. We're always ready. <laughs> I'm this sure is, you are. <laughs> this is the best night of our year. Okay. We are here and ready to go. All right. We've been, we've been waiting around. No, we haven't been. So, thank you for your flexibility on this. I was the one who sort of pushed this a little bit later, so I do. That's appreciate no it. problem. So, can you identify who's on? With you here tonight from the school department i see i see i would love to yeah so um hi everybody my name is jane morgan i am the uh, current uh acting chair of the arlington school committee for another uh, about 10 days and a few hours uh i guess until april 10th until the town election um i have been serving since june of 2020 so like a decade ago uh, or at least it feels that way uh, for our schools right now. So with me this evening, or with us this evening, um, is our uh, superintendent of schools, Dr. Kathleen Bodie, uh, Mr. Michael Mason, who is our CFO, and um, Dr. Kirsty Allison Ampey, and uh, Mr. Lynn Cardin, who are members with me of the budget subcommittee. Dr. Uh, Allison Ampey chairs that subcommittee. Um, very ably. Um, and then we also have this evening with us uh, Dr. Elizabeth Holman, who is um, our new superintendent of schools, uh, effective uh, July 1st. Uh, more than uh, two years ago, uh, Dr. Bodhi notified us that it was her intent to retire at the end of this school year and uh and what a school year it has been <laughs> she's certainly going out in a big way <laughs> um and uh so we uh the school committee hired dr holman back in december of 2020 and she has been uh, working on her transition planning so i just wanted to give her a second to say hello to everybody this evening hi everyone thank you for having me it's nice to zoom meet you um, and to listen in this evening, it's been evident to me, and I've had a very warm welcome from everyone in Arlington, 
that the schools are in a real position of strength after a very challenging year, thanks to Dr. Bodie's leadership and the leadership of her team. So get back to business. I'm mostly here to listen in and thank you for including me. And I look forward to working with you all in the future and implementing this FY22 budget. Well, thank, thank you, um, Dr. Dr. Homan, um, but welcome to Arlington. Um, Dean Carmen, did you want to make some introductory comments? Yeah, I'll um before we start, I'll I'll make two points for the to the to the committee. Um, the first is I, I do want to note and recognize the extraordinary accomplishment of our of our school system this year. Um, you know, when the pandemic hit, they were they were tasked with essentially building three schools and reopening them. And, and, you know, they have a school of kids that go Monday, Tuesday, you know, home three days. They have a school of kids that go in Thursday, Friday, home there three days, and they have kids that are all remote. And on a process that I think would have taken in normal times, three, four years to do, they were given three or four weeks to do it. I mean, so they, they literally this year have been, you know, the, the saying of, you know, building the plane as it takes off, that's what they've been doing. Um, so I think they deserve, as I said to you guys in the fall or everyone in the fall, they deserve our, our, our praise and thanks for their, for their great work. As we move to the budget, the second thing I do want to bring up is there are probably going to be a lot of issues we talk about tonight. I do want to just sort of make my own comment on this, that um, most of these issues, all these issues we discussed tonight are, are essentially just technical points. You know, I, I've gone through, I've been all, at all of their budget subcommittee meetings. I've watched their school committee meetings. Um, I want to make it clear up front that there is not a single, if I was in Dr. Bodie or Mike Mason's position, there's not a single decision I would have made differently, like at all. Now, we can, so we can discuss as we move forward on some technical points and admit procedures and policy and things like that. But all of the work they did, I'm, I'm, I will represent you, was, was rock solid the entire way. So. With that as the backdrop, I will yield the floor to Mike and Kathy. Thank you, Dean. Um, Jane, uh, do you want to turn it over to Mike and Kathy at this point, or what? I sure do. Okay. I think Dr. Bode is going to start. Mike. Go right ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, great to see you, even if it is on Zoom. Um, so, Ken, thank you for having us. This is uh, to our annual uh, meeting and. Um, uh, to Dean Carmen, thank you for your comments leading up to this. Um, most appreciated. I, I have to say, it has felt a lot like building a plane as we're as we're applying, and just you know, as we've gone through this year, having to do a, a lot of changes and uh, adaptations, the amount of learning that has gone on may have taken also years to do in terms of uh, our te technology competence. Um, and now we're faced with actually changing entirely again as we begin this coming uh, Monday with a full uh, a full time in person return uh, to uh, to school. I will just as a preparatory comment is that we have um, allowed parents to make a choice. Parents guardians make a choice as to whether they were going to be returning from a remote a remote uh, academy school to the in-person. In and actually what's very interesting is that we've had roughly about only 10%. So we had about 850 students in the elementary in a remote academy, and we have about 80 students returning um, to in-person to in this coming uh, Monday. But even with that, we're, there's still an immense amount of planning has gone on. And, and I, I do want to call um, you know, a special thank you and appreciation to the team I work with, which has been, uh, they've been a joy to work with and they are so confident and they, they get things done. Um, they have worked tirelessly this year to make sure that our students get the best possible education they, they can get and uh, live up to the standards that the Arlington community has, in, has, has for our school district. And the trust that has been given by our parents this year to do a good job. So we have great teachers, great administrators, and without them, we would not be having the, the success we've had this year. 
So with that, um, I would like to just make a few preparatory comments about our presentation this evening. Uh, most of it's going to be given by um, Michael Mason, who I think everyone here knows is our chief financial officer for the district. And um, he is going to, to uh, give most of the presentation. But I will just say this before we begin, um, that there are a number of slides in the presentation, and I, we're not going to go through all of them. Th they're really here for your information in terms of some of the background um, of, of, who, of, first of all, what our vision is and mission and who contributed to making this um, um, the, the plan for FY22 and for that matter, previous budget plans. So we're not gonna go through all of those. Um, Jane Morgan has already introduced um, the school committee members that are here this evening. I don't know if there's any others. We have to go through the, I think we're in a 25 by 25 grid here. So I can't see everybody, but um, I'm sure that there's others who will be joining us. So the, um, the agenda for this evening is that we're going to look at both the FY19 and 20 budget review, and then take a look at the FY2021 20, budget update and some of the uh, expenses we've incurred this year due to COVID. And then we'll get into the FY22 budget overview. We will then look at the five-year plan as well as just open it up for questions. And both um, uh, Mike Mason and I will be available for questions. I'm sure members of the school committee who are here will also uh, be available. So Mr. Mason, would you like to begin where we are? We'll probably go down to, uh, you can tell us which slide we're gonna be at. We'll start at slide number 10. That's our 10, okay. Yeah, okay. the budget process you're all pretty much aware of anyway. We've had this a similar slide every year, so so if you if you have your presentation, and are are you, are you going to share the screen? Yes, I am. Okay, all right, great. Just trying to navigate Zoom here. You're a high tech guy, Mike. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate it. For some reason, my Zoom updated, and it is all different right now. Those have heard have no how much of a of an expert he is. Hmm. This is interesting. All right, let me uh do this in a different way. <clears throat> so while we all sit awkwardly. Fine, All right, well, should I talk a little bit more then? Yes, you could talk a little bit more. I'm sorry. All right. Um, so one of the things I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with because you've um, heard that uh, conversation we have up. Oh. All right, say by the bell. All right, go ahead. Sorry about that, yes. I'm um, just gonna talk about pool testing, that's all. Go ahead. All right, so uh, Kathy uh, kind of uh, touched based on on, on the agenda. There might've been a, a rearrangement of one particular slide. So um, your numbers may be off down the line if you're following the PDF that was provided before. Um, but uh, I, I just wanna state that in case you start to see that it looks different. Um, but I'll uh, possibly notify you when that will occur. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, before we get into the FY22 budget of the part of the presentation, uh, I wanted to first start and take a look back at how the FY19 and FY20 budgets did compare and, and how those blueprints held up to what actually happened in those years. Um, so this slide that I'm starting off with uh, compares FY19s and FY20s budgets to um, the actual expenditures. Um, in FY19, the, that the particular budget was created by my predecessor. Uh, that year, um, as reported in monthly expenditure reports during that time frame when I first came on, 
Um, you can always find our reports on the, all on the public public schools website if you if you haven't seen them. The the district had a little excess in special education in FY19, and uh, that excess was driven by having a a 1.2 million dollar a balance from out of district tuition and transportation. However, um, that same year, uh, the the budget for facilities was under budget. And it was under budgeted in two main areas. Um, utilities, which includes electricity and natural gas as to power and to heat our buildings. And also the budget didn't account for uh, some new contracts that were the, the district was uh, had bid out for, which included a vendor that was for snow removal. Um, and for some reason, uh, there was not as many, that wasn't a lot of snow that particular year, but for each snow event, there was a substantial amount of money used for, um, for uh, snow removal due to that particular new bid and new vendor that we were using for that year. And the facilities director at the time did use that outside vendor. And, and, and right now we're in the transition with the capital plan on trying to implement more vehicles to do more of the internal snow removal work um, instead of uh, relying on an outside vendor. And uh, Therefore, the, depart the school department that year was fortunate to have the excess funds um, due to that special education to cover some of the uh, uh, overspending in the other departments. That year, also, the school administration recommended to move uh, the remaining excess budget of the special education to a reserve um, special education uh, fund to address any special education needs in the future. Um, and that and and it was mainly once again due to the out of district tuition. So if you look at this particular uh, slide under the FY19 variance, there's 1.2 million. There was a 900,000 that comes from facilities, which kind of left us with this 250 thousand dollars, a little bit less to move into the reserve. What I would also like to make note is that when I started my tenure in the middle of that fiscal year. I, I started uh, around January 2019 and as a part-time staff with during the transition to my prior place of employment. And really I started working in that February. And uh, that first weeks that I was there in February, I was tasked to complete the FY20 budget. And it was not enough time per se to meet with every single department head to develop a budget that was gonna be completely cohesive. So we, there were certain assumptions that I had to make when making the FY20 budget. So I, at that time, did level fund uh, many budget department bu budgets. And in some areas, I did provide uh, an increase based on inflation. And so what you'll see is um, without really um, knowing some of the trends that were possibly coming down the line in a possible pandemic, uh, the special ed out of district transportation, I mean, in tuition and transportation line slightly increased, but without knowing that there was going to be a substantial decrease in the upcoming year. And so, um, and then on top of that, uh, we, you know, we, we looked at spending trends. I had the team look at spending trends from FY18 because that was the only year we could look at. And in FY18, special education spending was a little different than what was going to be the result of FY19. Um, we also could not predict the fact that we were gonna have the pandemic. So uh, th this is part of the story of understanding FY20 that we had to close operations in the last three months of the fiscal year. That closure led to many of the schools the, in department heads, uh, administrators to pause the normal operations and spending and focus on changing the educational model from a full in-person to a remote program. And all while being left in the dark in some situations about understanding when will we reopen and um, or if we were going to be permanently uh, closed for the remainder of the year. Um, and at some point in that in that towards the end of the year, we did find out, but you know it was very it was very an uncertain situation. Um, but during that closure, also, what compounds this is that a lot of our special education placements, some of the programs were on pause too. And in a lot of the cases, we did see a reduction in spending 
in those in placements at the end of the year, as well as a reduction in transportation costs, because we were we were making some payments to reserve the transportation vehicles, but we were not spending at the full rate, hundred percent rate. Many of the times we were spending between sixty to seventy five percent of what the rate was. So we were still seeing seeing savings at the end of the year, which then led to the ultimate surplus, which we once again recommended to the school committee as an administration to move money into a special ed reserve to protect from any volatility from special education expenditures, as well as um, to cover uh, the um, prepayment of out of district tuition, because we didn't know what the budget was going to be in FY22, I mean, FY21, excuse me, uh, because we hadn't heard anything from at the state level, what was going to happen because due to the delays of certain things. So that brings us to FY21. And like the previous slide shows, this is just expenditures on the, gen the, the general fund appropriation, if I didn't explain it, sorry. Um, and we had to maintain basically two different models as Dean said earlier, um, but it was, you know, he puts it as three different models, but a hybrid model and a, a fully remote model. And that, that caused us to develop many extra staffing that we needed to get extra hours throughout the summer that took to prepare for reopening. Um, this all happened while being spoon fed different guidelines at the state level. And sometimes the guidelines would slightly change and we would then also have to adjust as well um, our plan. We also this year had to buy, obviously, as you know, many organizations had to buy additional PPE. We had to contract vendors to ensure our buildings were equipped with uh, the, the right uh, ventilation equipment or that they were working appropriately. Um, we also increased cleaning services to make sure that the buildings were meeting the cleaning protocols that we were agreeing with with our bargaining units. Uh, we also obviously had to hire many different types of staff to meet the, the student needs and uh, among many other equipment that we purchased. Um, so if you think about it, if you look at this, um, you would think that the bottom line would be that we would reflect that $1.3 million that we prepaid in FY20, which show us the balance here um, in FY21, right? As a projected balance. But with all the ex extra expenditures, you'll see that, yeah, we did carry uh, and we reduced special ed uh, tuition a little bit this particular year. And you'll see that we were still carrying a slight uh, sir, uh, excess in uh, out of district tuition. But the same amount was currently, we're holding almost about a million dollars of COVID related expenditures that have not yet to be placed on other funding sources, um, such as like the municipal cares funds. And so I, I bet the many of the questions uh, that many of the members of the finance committee has today is what we're likely to return back. So what I, I would say is that we're, we're, we're basically almost guaranteed unless something substantially changes or uh, requirements that we are not foreseeing that we're, we need to pay for, this is amount that would likely go back to the town. And if there's any eligible items to be claimed out of the CARES municipal funds, these funds would um, also likely go back and be turned to the town's general fund. And overall, to, to say that we're overspending due to the COVID related expenditures um, in general by that million dollars that I reflected in the previous slide, we're also, um, we did receive a lot of additional grant funds um, that's covering uh, from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, some of our COVID related expenses. And up to today, we've spent about $1.3 million out of the municipal side of the CARES related funds. Overall, we spent about $4.1 million between FY20 and FY21. Um, this year alone is around $3.5, $3.6 million. So I, what the, 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 the bottom line is that if we didn't do as some moves as, as, a, as a school department and school committee to prepay, um, we would be having a different conversation right now about how our budget would look because there were so many expending that we had to do. That prepayment move and, uh, was very key uh, and it was very it was an integral decision that we had to make to be able to 
meet our, uh, live within our means of our own budget this year. So now let's talk about the FY22 budget. So we, we got off the previous the historic um, budget and uh, how the expenditures played against those blueprints. Um, this year, um, I, I normally show that I show this slide the last two years is a slide that represents um, all the revenue sources uh, between local contribution to town, chapter 70 with state aid, our grants, and circuit breaker. And this, this, is, this is just to show the trends. So uh, this year, we're on all of our funding sources, we're going up about four and a half percent, which is lower than our previous years that we've gotten, which makes sense because of the pandemic and possible questions, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. But state aid hasn't increased substantially due to enrollment. And, and um, that's, that's gonna be the case also with the, currently the town, the, the town allocation due to um, being held harmless due to an enrollment decrease, which I'll discuss a little later. So this breaks down the current FY22 anticipated revenue. We can't make a budget without understanding our revenues. Um, overall, we're seeing a $4.5 million increase uh, from the town appropriation. That includes the local contribution of the tax levy to, and, the, um, and the state aid. So we're seeing about a 6% a increase um, overall. And we're seeing a decrease in grants due to what's getting a substantial amount last year uh, from the CARES uh, or related grants through the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, there are some other grants that might be coming through the line. We're not 100% sure. Um, and we'll be planning out the ones that we do know. And we're also seeing a reduction in circuit breaker because as our special education out of district tuition expenses decrease, our circuit breaker revenue will decrease, which is a reimbursement to offset those extraordinary costs. And we're just seeing a slight deduction in some revolving and reimbursements as we recalibrate our budget for the fiscal 22. So that leaves us with a grand total of our operating budget on the, under the school committee appropriation um, of $87,281,032 and $32, which overall is a net increase of about 3.6%. This is another chart showing that 75%, which is the most majority of our the taxpayers' dollars pays for the, the school department's budget. And this year it's been reduced the percentage wise to state aid, which is was down from 22% to 17%. There was an increase of about, uh, not a substantial increase, but, um, like I said, of the 1.3%, which was really about $30, $30 per pupil from our October 1st enrollment. This explains how we are spending our money. Our largest spending category is special education. Over $24 million will be dedicated to what we plan to spend on special education. That includes an adjustment that I'll discuss in a future slide to out of district tuition. Um, then, then followed by secondary as the second level and closely followed by elementary spending. Secondary would include the high school, Audison Middle School and the Gibbs School. Another thing we need to consider when developing the budget is the enrollment. So if, if you remember a few, sl few slides ago, we discussed the impact that enrollment, I said, on, had on state aid but it's also in impacts the formula that is used to fund education in Arlington with the local agreed formula. Uh, one of the main questions that the school administration has is what will enrollment look like in FY22? I mean, I think that's the guess is very difficult to, to understand what that enrollment will look like. In this slide, you will see that um, this, this graph tracks enrollment growth, which is this gray or bluish gray line, um, depending on how your screen shows it from FY 12, um, fiscal 2012 all the way to fiscal 2020. Eight years of enrollment growth. That was until we seen a substantial decrease of a net loss of 287 students that happened in fiscal 21. This graph also shows that there was a, there's a projection that we use that also factors into the long range plan. This was the original enrollment growth 
projection, and that was in the original plan. Still showing growth going up to fiscal 25. Um, and it would probably would have shown growth even beyond that, depending on how the trends were working. But um, looking at an adjusted, uh, using the this year's, uh, we, we, when we, let me take a step back. When we create the five-year enrollment projection, it uses a, a five-year weighted average. And so um, with this decrease this year, it was throwing the projections off completely. It was going in a downward direction, which probably was not likely to be the case going forward um, based on what was happening in Arlington and the real estate trends and all the, the different types of transactions that were occurring. Um, so I did some analysis looking at the, the students that left the district. We then took four select groups um, and those groups consisted of those that were being put into homeschool, those that were going to private school, uh, those that decided to hold their children back at the lower grades and um, to try to figure out if there's the students would return to the district. And we then used the percentage of the, the people that were gonna send their kids back to then determine a rate that would then factor into um, adding those kids back into the base of FY21's enrollment. And then use the same five-year weighted average from the previous trend, since this was an anomaly year, to then develop an adjusted projection. That's what this yellow line is. This yellow line then shows that there will be growth, especially in FY22. But here's the thing, these lines between the old projection and this adjusted projection are trying to show that the, the enrollment can be anywhere in between this or possibly higher because we're not sure how many students are out there. And it's very difficult during this time to understand what, par what parents are, are going to do in terms of enrolling their students. Some parents might be waiting for a transition year. Some parents may not. Some parents may be waiting to see when, when and how this, um, this implementation of bringing students back on April 5th, and as we bring the middle schools back uh, and the, at the, towards the end of April, I believe April 27th, um, you see how, how successful it is before they decide to register their children. Um, so currently uh, it's, it's still up in the air, and, but we have to be prepared for that. We have to be prepared for what could be um, and not be caught in a position that we're not, we're, we don't have enough resources to support the kids coming back. So overall, if we think about before on the original slide, we were getting an increase of an additional $4.5 million on the town appropriation. And when we take out our needs, um, then we have actually less, less money to use for the additions or additional resources that we would like to add to support our students in FY22. So taking off 2.3 to 2.4 million dollars, which would go towards contractual or salary increases that we know about that we need to do based on ob certain obligations, as well as we're still under we were still underfunding utilities in our budget. So we were going to phase this in and we're increasing utilities again by another 260 thousand, and this should support the utilities almost nearly 100% on the budget. And then the remainder, um, we were looking at doing some, um, some increases to departmental budgets as we weren't, we hadn't done too ma many major adjustments in the previous years. And also looking at this red number shows that we're going to reduce, since we were having a little excess in out of district tuition, we're going to reduce after recalibrating and looking at um, um, certain trends. We're going to reduce our, our out of district tuition by $1.2 million, which then gives us a little bit more to then look at um, what we'll have left for the proposed additions. I provided you uh, with the sheet. I'm not going to go through um, all of the additions, they're there for you to see them. 
um, just to save time, we'll, we'll move past the next couple of slides. Um, that's after this next slide, which just discusses when we were developing the budget, the, we, we have to devel develop the budget with understanding that there's certain budget priorities and highlights and things that we were trying to accomplish. So we focus on ensuring that we at least had, at least attempt to provide a level service budget where we continue to keep class sizes at the same level as possible. And we also focused on trying to maintain the level of course offerings, the flexibilities to offer more courses for courses that were filled due to the demand of that offering. We also had discussions about how we can better serve the needs of students with special needs and provide support to subgroups to help those groups improve and achieve academic goals and decrease the achievement gap. As well as we were looking at enrollment trends and and, uh, and making sure we provo provide support and resources towards the goal of equity, inclusion, and access, and making sure we put some investments in the mathematics support in those fields. So I will um, skip through these slides, and if there's any questions about them, you can ask towards the end. The last, uh, the last towards thing I want to talk about is the multi-year plan. Two years ago, we had we created a multi-year plan that we brought to the voters to provide for an override. And so many of the additions to the FY22 budget were requests in the five-year plan. When we as a district went through the budget development process this year, we had to definitely evaluate where we stood in regards to the five-year plan. And we had to see if there was still a need for many of the requests, but also look and see what we needed to provide for, for support for possible loss of learning due to the pandemic. And so um, we also had to look at requests that, that we did not fill in FY20 now or FY21. And if we could try to accomplish any of those requests in the current budget. And as always, once we determined what we could, would like to add to the FY22 budget, we had to reprioritize requests going forward for those that we couldn't keep in the budget. On the next slide, I mean, I'm sorry. And on this slide, on this, there's a link for the, the five-year plan that was original. But um, on the next slide, this is just a snapshot of the original plan by categories, by the strategic priorities. And it was a close to a $10 million request. Um, and if we're, we're looking at it from the, the highest level, and I believe this is the core to this update, this five-year update, is you look at, there's two bars here. The top bar is if for the first two years from FY20 and FY21, if we fulfilled every request that we could, we would have, we would have been looking at about $5.2 million, $5.3 million worth of requests. And we would have about 4.6 million remaining for FY22 to FY24. And well, the, bar, the bottom bar is showing that this is what we actually have been able to accomplish. $3.1 million to $3.2 million worth of requests. And we have about 6.7 million left to go. And if one was to look at it as, you know, so you'll see it as we're 2.1 million behind the request that we, where we would have liked it to be. If we were to separate the, the, this, these into equal segments, and we're about 40% away through the budget in FY21, we're about 30% into the accomplishing that budget. And meaning we're between nine to 10% behind the plan. And so that's what I wanna provide as an update to the five-year plan. And the last slide is a slide that was earlier in the budget, I mean, in this presentation that you received that is now later here. And I'm going to end it with this is say so this is where we're benchmarked compared to the town manager 12 districts that kind of Arlington compares themselves to. And as you may know, these are the, you know, um, we were once, if you, if, if you remember the slide last year, we were in the middle of the pack last year. We've dropped down three slots to those comparative districts. Um, and this is the most up to date per pupil expenditure data that's available from Department of Elementary Secondary Education. And once we get 
newer data, I, I hope to be able to provide that somewhere uh, on, the, on the Arlington Public Schools website. At this point, um, if you need any additional information about our budget, you can find it once again on the Arlington Public Schools website at the following link. And uh, we will now open it up for questions and I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Mike. That was a um, <clears throat> was a great presentation. So um, it's a lot to uh, digest in a couple of minutes, but uh, let me ask uh, the members of the finance committee what questions you may have for for um, for Mike or for Kathy or for any of the school department representatives. Let's see. I give me one second. I have to get back to this. As uh, Kathy noted before, we can't see all the people at one time here. So are there any uh, questions? Well, it looks like you've got everybody awestruck, Mike. No, no, uh, Charlie, John Ellis has his hand up and so does Brian Beck. Oh, and okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I was looking for the, uh, so John Ellis. Thanks. Um, I'm looking at the, um, from last year, and there were um, 22 positions to be added for the high school, for the middle school, 6.3 the elementary, including one assistant principal. This year, uh, you've got um, overall. Uh, how many overall? Um, seven reserve. I can't exactly tell how many overall you have in, in the in the new one, but two two assistant two and a half assistant principals. So my my question is, did you actually hire in fiscal twenty one those point nine additional? Uh, positions in a proposal or, or maybe maybe you were unable to because of COVID or, or something like that. Hey, Kathy, would you like me to answer this? Uh, we, you can talk about the, the total number and yeah. positions we had to hire. Yeah, so many of the positions that were in the FY21 budget, we were able to eventually hire some of those. They're still being carried in the budget as needs if they were not hired. Um, and then we did have to add additional positions in FY21 to meet the COVID uh, related needs or having the two, the two different models going. So additional staffing was definitely needed to, to be able to host a remote model and then also be able to support um, the students in a, um, in a hybrid model where students would come in uh, two days a week um, and three days off and doing a remote learning. Um, it was there an, another sec, I'm trying to re remember all the statements you made in terms of, I hope I answered in terms of the FY21 portion of your question. So there were 22.9 in fiscal 21 and I was wondering, did you, hire all of those and and how many total new ones are there in fiscal so how many new ones are in fiscal 22 is what you asked yeah yeah so there overall there's a net change in positions for fiscal 22 which is and i can actually let me put up a slide and maybe this might help i see you have it like individual like Secondary and uh, yeah, but I don't just don't see the total. In this line. There's the position control document in so, your. Okay. So if I can show here this 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 particular slide, it explains okay. it a little differently in a summarized view. And so, um, in FY21, these are the positions that were approved, and then after the fact, there were some additional positions that we did need, and um, this is what we ended up in FY21. This year, we're having about 38 positions gonna be added. 
and we're reducing the positions, um, certain select positions by 18.2 for a net increase of around 20 positions this year. Okay. Does that, does that better help you, John? It, that does. And I guess that just the final question is maybe for Dr. Bodia. I'm not sure, but you know, like the, the, the override, we were going to get more mass support. There was going to be social workers in the middle school. There's going to be these assistant principals. And, and, and then you had some different needs because of all these different requirements in two schools for coronavirus. Are those things that we're committed to and were in the previous budget, are those still going to be filled? Um, it, John, if you look in the uh, the list of positions that we are going to um, actively look for, includes social workers. In fact, um, originally we we're going to just have a split social worker between Gibbs and Austin, but given the needs we perceive will happen next year for more support for social emotional and um, uh, needs of the students, we're going to have a social worker at each school. Um, there is um, in the budget support for learning needs, which include math interventions. And yes, we did hire additional math intervention uh, teachers this year. We had a situation where we had three of our elementary schools that did not have um, math intervention support, and we did hire uh, for that this year. So now all of our elementary schools have some math intervention support. Thanks, that does answer the question. Thank you, I'll thank you, in. Kathy. So uh, Brian Beck, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Um, I had a quick, well, might not be quick, I have no idea. Uh, I had a question about the enrollment, which obviously is the main driver of the budget, or mm -hmm. at least it appears to be. Yep. Um, the fact that it took a dent this year. Um, first question, uh, if you have the knowledge of what happened to those students? Where did they go? Yeah, um, go ahead, Kathy, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Actually, um, I did a really complete analysis on this in terms of the students um, that left and, why, and wh where they went. Give me one second just to pull up, make sure that I have a chart here. Um, and we, we actually did send a survey out to the students that had not left Arlington because we do have students, international students, other families that move out of state, move out of, move out of Arlington to another community. But we did, in, we did send a survey out just to see what, the, uh, what um, parents wanted to do, parents, guardians wanted to do next year. Do you have... Um, yeah. Share, yeah, I think you do. I'm going to share the screen. Give me one second. So, um, this was a thank, um, thank you for blowing it up. Yes, yes, of course. Um, I know some of our eyes are you know, need to work a little bit harder to see things in your screen, depending on your screen. So um, this was uh, part of an analysis that I did for um, student exit uh, data. So this, this was data that we collected when a student left the district and what was uh, coded into our, our, our student information system. So um, the ones that were highlighted, these were the categories of the students that I actually, or families that I surveyed. Um, these were the students that were easily identifiable as students that would probably come back or will have a possibility of coming back. Those that moved out of the district or moved to spe specifically to other countries or another state or a town and city, I did not actually survey, um, but there could, be, there could be some situations where they might do come back. Some of them were like students that had parents that lived in different towns and, and places. So the parent decided to send their child to another place temporarily during this time frame, and then they might come back. So, um, but there was those special instances that I wasn't going to get into the details 
in terms of my analysis. So overall, what it shows is that the 287 students we lost is a net loss. It's not, so you have students that graduate every year, and then you have students that come in at the bottom in the, the lower grades. So that's what you'll see at the bottom is the graduation students. Um, and um, above that is students that either transferred from APS to a different school, or we didn't have, maybe a few didn't have enough su sufficient data for me to determine that, um, which was really immaterial. Um, so about 700 students left the district for various reasons, but there was enough that came back to the district that did the net of 287 student loss. Well, I guess as I look at your chart, um, homeschooling, if somebody's homeschooled, I could see them coming back immediately if the schools resume. I, I'm going on the assumption that um, starting in September, things will start to normalize, especially after the news today that uh, the Pfizer vaccine is 100% effective on 12 to 15 year olds. Uh, I assume they'll, they'll do more research on the younger um, kids as well. Uh, would it be expected that somebody who sent their uh, child, especially at a younger age, to a private school would bring them back? Would that be an in expectation? Some, in some instances, I did see in their survey results that students were going to come back from private schools. It all depends on the family situation. And then there were some instances where parent, families did put comments where they said they were, they were going to send their children back, but it may not be until a year or two because of waiting to the next transition. Okay. All right. Thank you. Alan Jones. Hi, Mike. Uh, one just a technical question. I was looking at your slides 14 and 15, and I th it just seems like some of the numbers are different. I don't think the pie chart adds up to the 87, 281, 032. So you might just want to look at that. And, I'll, do, um, I'll definitely double check that. Um, what you said, slide number fourteen. You said? Four, four, 14 is the table. Yep. That does total eighty-seven two eighty one zero three two. But then if I look at fifteen and I add the five numbers together, I get about a half a million dollars off. So I don't just yeah, maybe I, I I'll have to double check. Yeah, the, um, no, not a big deal. Uh, uh, the 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 broader question I had, you mentioned in the revenue sources that uh, I mean grants are uh, projected grants are down by a million too. Um, there's the American Rescue Plan and who knows what else might show up. What's the, how do you handle if you have sort of unexpected grant revenue? You know, what, what happens to that? You know, let's say you got 2 million for the American Rescue Plan. How, how is that handled? Um, well, I think that is a, a good question. And I think that it may be best suited that Kathy might put some input. Um, in terms of when we're made aware of a funding source, we, um, you know, look at what the requirements are and how to apply for that funding source and what, how could we best use it? And, you know, our goal as a school district, as long as I've been here, is, is always to try to take advantage of every grant that we could possibly take advantage of. We then, uh, Kathy typically assigns off to key, key, key uh, employees to then come up with plans on how to implement any grant and, and apply for the grant and, and see if we can get awarded. Uh, I will then now heat off to Kathy to see if he has any <clears throat> input on that. Well, I think, Alan, you mentioned the, uh, the federal stimulus money. We are, the, the money actually hasn't come to DESE yet, but it's going to be distributed through the Title I formula, which means for Arlington, we will get about 1.1, I think, about 1.1, maybe slightly more than that. We haven't been given our allocation yet. That money can be spent over two fiscal years. So um, I will say that our first priority right now for that money, we're sort of, <laughs> sort of spending it, anticipating that's going to come, uh, is, is uh, our summer program. Last year, we had an experience uh, we call it sort of an expanded Title I uh, summer five-week program for students to have some extra support, tutoring, and uh, instruction in um, um, math and literacy. Uh, this year, we're planning to do exactly the same thing, but maybe a little bit more expanded. 
than we did last year. We, in fact, we uh, were just talking about this this afternoon, uh, what this might look like. Uh, we have we have a committee that is is together right now, and it's actually a lot of people who worked on last year's uh, summer program, and that is a priority going forward this year. In fact, with the federal stimulus money, they want at least twenty percent of the money spent on programs to help students who may um, may need, have some learning needs as a result of this year. I will say that one of the things that um, we have been doing, as you, as you know, over the last uh, many years, is increasing our number of interventions in our school system. And by that, I mean math interventionists, uh, reading teachers, um, uh, coaching, and, and, and which has a direct impact, indirect, but direct impact for student learning. And particularly, we're looking to support direct student learning. And that, that percent of our budget has been, been growing over the years. And I expect that that's where the, probably the primary place we would want to use this money is to increase those kind of supports. Okay, I guess you know my you know always the concern is spending one-time money for long-term obligations. Um, I know there was another department where it seemed like some positions were grant funded, the grants went away, but the positions still exist. So then, you know, that rolls over to the tax fund. So, yeah. I mean, using one-time money for one-time expenses is a good thing. Pretty, it's pretty much that. Um, certainly, that's what happens. Sometimes you though, I will say, when you have a grant. And the position becomes so important that you try to figure out another way to maintain that kind of service. But pretty much that, you know, if, if we don't have the grant money for something, that particular thing that we were funding goes away. So the things that we have our eye on right now and, and a considerable planning effort is for the summer. I will say another thing talking about one time exp expenses is that we, I think that it's going to be important for the district to maintain the, um, the online tools that we have invested in over the, over the years. So it's not really a position as it is um, supports that we can have for students. Um, the, the other thing that I think we're really going to need to look at, and this is a little more complicated than may, may seem. We have about 4,000 devices on loan to families right now. And we're going, when, we, when the students who have these uh, loans are going to be coming back into school, we're gonna have them go back and forth. But I think that we're going to have to take a, um, a real look at what, um, what more we need in the way of technology. And I know that the Capital uh, Planning Committee has been very generous in allocating monies for this need. And I see that continuing to be the case. Um, so there are a lot of expenses, things that we hadn't even thought about having to uh, fund this year um, that probably are gonna have some continued um, effort, financial effort. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bode. Al Tosti. Thank you, Kathy. Yes, um, Mr. Mason. I, I just have a few questions. Um, one of them I, is just a confusion between two totals. You have a grand total on of the the page with all of the revenues of eighty seven million two eighty one zero three two. But then on page nine, which is just before it, you have a grand total of eighty six million seven ninety three two hundred, and. It, it's a difference of 487,000 and change. Typo or are they two different numbers? Sorry, I'm if, trying If I could to... just butt in, that's the difference between page 14 and 15. So I think they're related. Yeah, it might be a, 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 a calibration of uh, refreshing the charts. I'll, I'll double check it. Al and, and, and get back to you. Okay. In terms uh, of that. Typical, the other question I had was on special ed. 
Uh, first of all, you, you mentioned uh, that you've been putting aside uh, money for special education reserve, uh, a, a few hundred thousand each year. So like as of today, how much is in the special ed reserve? Approximately. Uh, it's about, it's, uh, it's between 650 to 700,000 that's sitting in there. Okay. And do you have a, uh, a sense what that number might be by June 30th, 21? Um, I, we have not made any recommendations to, to move any additional funds into the reserve this year. All right. We've been, we had discussions about possibly what we can look at turning back if we sense certainty of future budgets and a okay. change in the climate. One of the uh, major um, efforts on the Long Range Planning Committee to help the school department um, was on special education, uh, which we have allowed uh, that number to grow by 7% a year, was based upon uh, studies done, I, I guess, several years ago that showed over 10 years, the average growth in special education expenditures was uh, 7%. But mm -hmm. if I'm just taking a look at a couple, like the last four years, I looked at two different charts and I came up with a 4.2% 4, 4 annual growth and a 5.7% annual growth. Do you have the number for the last 10 years of, of growth in special education uh, of the actuals, both with, without and with interventions? Without and without. without. Um, I, go ahead, Kathy. Oh, oh, Michael, we don't put interventions, Al, um, into the special education numbers. That's all in the general fund. We keep that, we've been trying to keep those, the special education costs pretty consistent of what we count year to year. Um, we do have a slide um, on showing the uh, special education over the last few years. But I, I can, we have the old slide to show you exactly what you're talking about. The, the regression line, there was a lot of years where it was higher, 12 some percent, and other years it was down five. But the regression line over the 10 years was about 6.99. So it was 7% was what is how we arrived at that number. Um, we continue to have some uh, years were higher and lower. We actually had a slide on that. Yeah, I, I can, I can, yeah, I can put it up. Okay. Can you, can you guys see the, the slide? I'm not sure what you see. My computer's different. Yes, we see it. Okay. Um, so this slide is um, all this, the information can be found with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, all the expenses uh, for special education from fiscal 2008 to fiscal 2019. Um, 2020's information has yet to be published from the Department of Elementary and Secondary, edu Secondary Education. But what I will say is that the figure is not too far off from 2019 figure. And so this chart shows the total town funding expenditures. This excludes revolving um, or any grant related expenditures um, or circuit breaker that is not included in these figures. And so um, from this period, this, the, 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 red, the red line is showing the, the percent change or the changes per year. So it goes up and down in terms of how much a change may have. So for example, I know in 2012, it was a year where um, I can show you in another chart where out of district uh, tuition had jumped that particular year. And it's always been a question of the volatility of, at least in my eyes, is what out of district tuition is going to look like. So if I, if I can, I'll move to the next slide here, which will then show this is just in district um, special education uh, expenditures. This is uh, not including out of district. And for the most part, except for what may have occurred between 2010 and 2011, um, we've seen 
substantial growth in the industry expects of education. That is what the district can control in terms of the services that we offer internally to our service, to our, our special education students in district. And um, what it doesn't, this isn't, this, this chart won't explain is how that, uh, that correlates to the special education enrollment in, in for the in-district enrollment. And then the last slide I really prepared was to show that, as I said, remember that 25% jump in fiscal 2012. Um, this is the out of district tuition and transportation expenditures. And it significantly jumped in 2012. And what it, this shows is that the part that we don't always control is the out of district placements. Um, some of it we can't control if we can provide the services in, in district, but we don't control who moves into the community, who may have special needs for that matter. Um, there was a time when there was a program like Jermaine Lawrence that was in the district where we did have additional special education costs as well during that time frame. So that would be reflective here. The overall trend, we did see increases. Um, in 2018, it was the highest year yet. And that also reflected uh, the following year, which is 2019, we had a substantial decrease. And that was what um, you saw for part of the surplus that we dealt with in FY19. And as well as another decrease that would show that this number goes lower in FY20. But if you look at the patterns, you have these peaks and valleys. And so it goes up a little, comes down, goes up, goes down a little few years, starts to trend back up. and there's a possibility as we've gone down the last few years that we might start to see a trend back upwards, especially in a time where we might have a lot of emotional support issues that might need to be addressed um, and other loss of learning that might translate into some other type of issue. Um, I'm not necessarily a professional in that manner. Um, I, the special education department team is a great team. And I'd imagine that there's a possibility that we might see upticks in result of this pandemic. You, uh, is this encoded in, your, in the presentation that you had sent to us? Uh, no, I will send an updated presentation with the changes in these numbers that, uh, you know, the updates to correct the figures that people have, have mentioned, and I will include some of these slides for that. That'd be great. Now, these are expenditures, not budgets. These are expenditures. These right. are all from Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Okay. And to answer your question, the, the, the average is still between 6 to 7% over the, that, that period. I don't show that regression line here, okay? But I don't have the exact percentage for you right now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Annie LaCourte. Thank you. Um, so I've got a, a question about um, the pie chart for revenues, uh, I'm sorry, expenses on page 16. Um, you have a slice there you call grants, which I, by which I think you mean uh, expenditures um, uh, for grant funded activities. Um, if I look at that breakdown in your actual budget, Michael, I see that about 50% of that, maybe a little bit more than 50% of that is actually for special education. Um, it would Correct. seem to me that rather than showing that slice as grants, that you should roll it into the places where it's spent. So that half of that should actually be in special education and the other half should actually be in probably other, given what it's covering, which includes METCO, et cetera. Um, simply because otherwise it's really unclear what that money is being spent on if you're going to represent it in a pie chart. And I'm sorry to be picky, except yeah. that it changes the view of those slices of the pie and it clarifies where that money is actually going. And you can see the 2897 as revenue in the revenue pie chart. So it's what, I appreciate that, that feedback. I, I, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't explain clearly why it's shown the way it's shown. Um, and I can explain that now. So thank you for asking this question or mentioning this comment. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I framed I, it as a question. I didn't mean to be yeah, telling. No, no, that. no. It's a great comment because some of my some of my um, part of the presentation shows how finance committee 
Um, I think there's every year I provide the categories based on how it's requested from this committee. Mm -hmm. And it actually is different than how the school committee votes it. So mm -hmm. this, this slide is actually based on the policy of the school committee. So the school Got committee it. has it us vote, uh, they vote on it based on grants as a whole, regardless mm -hmm. of the type of grant, because um, the grants have specific purposes and um, they, they may, they, they do not, they don't usually change unless right. we're getting a different type of grant. And so, um, so far it's always been lumped in together. So I think I'll take that feedback and bring it back to the budget subcommittee and, uh, and discuss whether they would like to make such an adjustment on their end, but as well as I can always change this slide just for this committee to show it the way you would like to see it. All right. I mean, it's it's certainly how I prefer to see it. I can see that the grant, what you're getting in grants from the revenue side and on the expense side, I just want to know where money's going. And awesome. grants is not an activity. Although obviously I have your detail page and I figured it out. Yeah. So, you know, if I'm the only person who cares, I'll translate. But I thought I'd mention it. Um, and then I just wanted to mention one other thing, which is on the analysis that Al Tosti was mentioning about special education. My recollection of that analysis, which I worked on, I think, with Kersey, um, was that we actually discovered that it was about on nine percent on average. So, if over the last ten years we've gotten special education costs down to seven percent a year and met the actual allocation, which was not as high as what the analysis showed we probably needed, then I think we're doing really good on uh, getting efficient and effective programming in special education. So I just wanted to call that out because it was a real problem for a long time. And it seems like we've achieved an improvement. Um, and that's everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. So uh, are there other questions now for, uh... For Mike or Kathy or anybody in the school department, uh, I just follow, Charlie. Can I just follow up uh, with the comment from what Annie pointed out? Sure, go right ahead. Um, I really appreciate you that you pointed that out, Annie, because there's been a lot of work in the special edu education department to really provide the services students need, and I think you you see that with some of the trends in our district placement. So I think they will very much appreciate the fact that you acknowledge the work that, they're, that they and, and all the teachers in our district are trying to uh, accomplish, which is parents prefer if there's, their child can, the needs can be met in district. And that's, that's been the goal and I'm glad you noticed it. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, um, well, I, I think I'd like to make a couple of, couple of comments if I might. First of all, uh, Mike, thank you for a really uh, outstanding presentation. So there's a lot of uh, good information and, and rich information there. Um, <clears throat> I, I'd like to bring the conversation back to an area that um, Al Tosti referred to earlier, which is our, our, plan, our long term planning process as a town. And, um, you know, we're in a situation right now where in a couple of years, we're going to be facing another override uh, requirement. And that requirement is probably going to call for something like a $17 million or $20 million tax increase um, on, the, on the community. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm looking at the town budgets and the school budgets from the viewpoint of how can we mitigate this, um, this impending high cost? Because I think when you're talking about tax increases with that order of magnitude, on top of the taxes that people are already paying for um, you know, their services, plus the investment that we're making in the Arlington High School and that we've made in other uh, mm -hmm. capital investments in the town, you're talking a substantial um, burden on the, on the average citizen. So roughly speaking, in the planning process in the last number of years, we have followed a, um, uh, looking at the, the growth of the school budget, we followed a, a growth rate, I think it was uh, three or three and a half percent for the general education 
7% uh, for SPED, and then we had a uh, per pupil uh, growth formula for increasing, uh, for the student uh, population increase, which um, I think is at 50% of the uh, state certified per pupil uh, cost. Now, Mike, in the, in the presentation that you just gave, um, it looked to me like, um, like we were, our, our out of district education costs are running somewhere between 1.5 and $2 million lower per year than in earlier years. Um, and this correlates uh, with what I've found looking at, I, I spent some time looking at the, uh, the state SPED reports that, you know, you can get all the reports for different towns, including Arlington. And uh, my calculations indicate that the compound growth rate on the special education from 2011 to 2021 is about 3.8% on, on their numbers. Now, there is a 12% growth number there in one year. But if you look at the growth rate over that decade, it, the compound growth rate is about 3.8% which is substantially under the 7% that the town has been budgeting. Um, wh where I'm coming from is that I, I think that from my view, and I'm speaking as an individual here, the town has, has always supported um, Arlington, the Arlington school system. And, and that's been in these, these operating formulas, it's been in capital spending and, and you know, a variety of different ways. And right now, we're looking at another big increase in the school budgets. Um, you have in this budget, you have COVID costs, uh, which I know you have incurred COVID costs, but I didn't see any, um, any netting out of uh, CARES Act funds against those uh, COVID costs. And I don't know whether that's in there or not in there, but my understanding is that there are uh, somewhere Many, as many as three COVID grants that the school department has got, and there's two COVID grants or COVID funding sources that will come through the town for the schools, you know, in excess of a million dollars, at least for the latter two, and possibly some big number. I don't, I'm not cl close to the, to the three school grants. So, um, in, in on your slide, I think it's slide. 14 or whatever, one of those slides, you actually show on the out-of-district tuition a drop in, uh, I think it's from 19 to 20 or 20 to 21, is a, it's almost uh, $4 million. It's a, it's a, a big drop in the, in the uh, out-of-district tuition. So it seems to me, you know, we're, we're one town here. We have common problems. We have um, streets to fix, we have students to educate, we have police to keep us safe, uh, parks to maintain. And, and um, you know, all of us should be thinking about how to constrain costs so that we can, uh, you know, move forward on, with reasonable amount of, of um, I don't know what the word might be, financial caution or something like that to protect taxpayers as we move forward. In, you know, I'd like to ask, um, is the school department thinking about the fact that if these special education costs are going down, uh, if we have these reserves, these, I mean, I, in one year you took the special education surplus and, and used it to pay maintenance expenses. And another, another year you had another special education surplus and you used it for something else. But that just simply says we're not managing the other parts of the budget. And I, I can understand in the middle of the COVID, you know, you've got to make ends meet, you've got to get things done. But we have a trend here, and that is these out of district costs are lower than they have been in the past. And, and if the town has stepped up and increased the amount of special education funding when you needed it, the town should actually be getting the benefit of that back uh, when it's not necessary. Now, um, I, I was looking at your, there was, a, there was a, um, a proposed budget on the, on the school department website dated February 25th. And, and uh, the, 
then there was another one that was posted. I don't know exactly when it was posted, but it was March 25th. And I looked, I mean, I can show it on the screen if you're interested, but I think you know the numbers. The out of district tuition in the first budget was uh, the combined categories was something, I'll, I'll say $8 million. And the, in the second category in the approved budget, it was more than $2 million less, okay? However, the total budgets in those two representations were $87 million and change for the total budget and $80 million and change for the town appropriation. So you took $2 million out of the special education budget and you put it someplace else. Where did it go? And, what, and, and why, why aren't we thinking about how to, how to help the town out and you know, the, get, some of the, get some of the pressure off taxpayers? I don't know if, who the question, maybe I'm just ranting here, but, um, but I don't know who the question is directed to, but I, I would like to think that the school committee and the school department is thinking about these things because the day is gonna come when there's gonna be some other problem and you're gonna need more money. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take the first, the, the last part of that, Charlie. And then I know that-, that Is that Jane? Yeah, sorry. sorry I, I, I can't. Did I get? I, I, I have to get you on the right screen here. Hang on. Yeah. So um, I know that Michael can speak to the to the to the COVID um, expenditures. He has that in a slide, and it's it is pretty close to a million dollars. I believe that in his presentation, he he did say that that was the money that um, should it be uh, eligible for um, for reimbursement that that would also be returned to the town at the end of this year. But I'll let him speak to that. And I think you know I think the piece here also that's really important is that. You know, we 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 did an override with commitments around the budget, right? That were three and a half percent, and and specific commitments around the general education budget and the special education budget. So, you know, we we did go to the voters with that uh, in June. So, if, if I may interrupt, Jane, I, uh, I guess <laughs> yeah. it's okay. your committee, Charlie. So, yeah, go thank for you. It. Those were those were those were in the in the planning process. For, that's the, just the general planning process that town has had for a long time. Yes, but I mean, we we campaigned on them, right? So the the arrangement that we made with the voters was around these increases to the different pieces of the school budget. So are you saying then um, that you're going to stand by the seven percent increase in a special education budget? Even if you've got two million dollars a year in, in surpluses that you're not and, and put it someplace else, I think that we need to go back and look at that. I think that there have been challenges with budgeting for out of district tuition, and it's something that uh, the team has worked on adjusting for looking into looking at FY22. And um, you know, I think that we certainly feel more comfortable at this point that we have a special education reserve fund that has some funding in it, which, which provides us the ability to, 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 you know, to buffer some of those, those changes, but it's, I mean, out of district tuition is super volatile. Um, so I, I'll let, I'll let Kersey, I see her hand up as well. So I want to let, give her a chance to add on to this. Kersey. Thank you. Um, I would agree with what Jane said that Special education is highly volatile. It's true that we've had a couple good years. Um, one of them was in the setting of a pandemic. And although we haven't heard of specific instances of how that may have affected families' decisions, whether or not to have their children in out of district placement or not, it's hard to see that it wouldn't. The school committee isn't privy to that kind of detail because we're not supposed to know what's going on um, in personal people's lives. Uh, but the reason we had allocated 7% to begin with, and, and as Annie said, my recollection is that what we came, the number we had come up with was 8.5%, and then it was talked down to 7% as being a reasonable number. Um, the reason we had that is to cover the years that are both good and bad. And 
I haven't done analysis since that time, but when I did it then, if we wanted to go with a lower percentage and have a reserve that would handle things, at that point, I the reserve I calculated was somewhere in the several millions or more um, of amount. And we can certainly look into that as a different way of handling budgeting, but that seems like a very high reserve. Uh, it's certainly not what we have now. It's not what we're allowed to have. Our budget, our reserve, I think, has a one million or one million and change cap. Um, so this is something that budget has planned to take up and look at, but we're going to be doing this over the summer. We have too much work with the school department and um, we have a new superintendent coming on and we think that's the better time to take a look at this. Uh, but it, it does appear that we're seeing somewhat less volatility than we were 10, you know, 10, 20 years ago, but there, it's still highly volatile. The other thing is that you're also, if I understand correctly, asking us to save money at a time when parents are going to be expecting the absolute utmost from their schools. We have been in a pandemic now for over a year. Kids have been getting different, the highest quality education that we can provide, but it's been under extremely difficult circumstances, both for our students, our families, and our teachers. And we're going to want to try and do some catch up. And if we start tightening our belts and nickel and diming things, we're going to see savings because people are going to move away from Arlington. They're going to feel that their students are not being supported and they are going to feel that this is not a place where they want to live. And I don't think that's what we want. Um, so, you know, yeah, there, there's trade-offs. I understand that it's going, you know, that the override coming is potentially big, but we also have hopefully money, some money from the stimulus that some of which will be able to be used for schools, but maybe some of it can be used for um, the stabilization fund. So I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Kiersey. Uh, I would just like to comment that I think um, when we're looking at numbers that have been flowing through this budget and been reallocated that are in the multiple millions, you know, a million and a half here, a million and a half there, um, over the last several years, um, that's not nickel diming. This is serious money. So um, it's not a, it's not an unreasonable uh, request when we have COVID funds, which I don't see reconciled here. When we have, well, I think that Mike's done an excellent job in, in tracking the, 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 the changes in the out of district and presenting the changes in the out of district um, tuition, which as they show up in the, in the presentation tonight, somewhat track the same thoughts that I had looking at it from other sources. But we're talking about substantial funds. And I think it's not unreasonable that the school department think about what it really needs in, in a time when a, we have a drop in the school population, when the costs of special education are going down, and in, um, you know, to, to understand what the implications are for the taxpayers. That's the, that's the question that I'm asking. And, and candidly, uh, from my own personal viewpoint, I don't see that in the proposed fiscal 22 budget. So, um, Mr. Mr. Charles, is it a question or is it a recommendation? I just am not, I mean, right. who's asking that question? Jane, sorry. Was, is it, a, is there a question or is it a recommendation? No, I'm, I'm, it's, uh, my question is, well, I, I did ask the question earlier, you know, what is, what is the school department going to do to help address some of these pressures on the town and the taxpayers? And I think they're significant. And I think there's room for, based on the information that we've seen, there's room to do that. And so I, you know, I think, I think 
my request would be that the school department take a look at that. Yes, that's my personal request. Yeah. Um, Did somebody else have a? Uh, the if, yeah, Charlie, Mike, go ahead, Mike. Speak. Um, I just want to, you know, make some corrections. I think that uh, you spoke about the budget changes um, between the special education budget between the February 25th yes. proposed budget to the um, March 25th proposed budget. Yes. So um, I can just share my slides again and explain, um, and I'll bring up what the changes were. And so I'm not sure if you remember this slide here. This was the proposed changes slide. And this, is the amount that should be reflected between the two different budgets where special education out of district tuition was being decreased by $1.2 million between the two budgets. Um, if you do have a different number, I, 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 I'd like to try to explain that. Maybe it's- well, let me, uh, I think I might. Have, but, um. If, um, if also, uh, there's a couple other things I just want to help you. Can I, uh, can I just sh share the screen with yeah, you for one second? Of course, of course. Um, if I can figure out how to do this. Let's see. Share screen. Okay. Um, this, this is, um, this, this is what I've taken from uh, your budgets. The, the, this is this, this on the left is these categories six, eight, nine, five. Or I can't. Even, it's a little small. Yeah, I can't Charlie, read. could you zoom in a little bit? Yeah, let me do that. Sorry, I can't read it from here, so you probably can't read it from there. Um, let me also get rid of this and go to the full slideshow. I'm, I'm trying. The... I'm trying. There we go. There you go. Okay get this out of the way here so um so in the in the proposed budget as i catch i just clipped I, I did a conversion of the spreadsheet to i mean of the pdf to a spreadsheet and just clip this stuff out okay so in the 22 proposed budget the february 22nd budget this added up uh this added up to 8.9 million that would be this category and that category and then in the in the uh, cost center uh, I'm sorry, in the approved budget, it was 5.97. So that's a difference of almost $3 million. And I'm just asking, oh. where did it go and why? You know? Oh, okay. I, I, I think I see what your, your question is. Um, so I'll, I'll double check that, those figures, but my understanding when we made the adjustments to the updated budget, there was an error in some of the formulas and that's what you're seeing but the net reduction was 1.2. So I would not look at the February 25th number as valid figures at all for those categories. So there was some double counting in that, those numbers, um, which you, you can see why it's substantially higher by a million dollars. That would actually not be the case. Okay, well, I, I mean, this is one point that I picked up. Yeah. Uh, there were, I think in the in the presentation that you gave, there were three years where there were surpluses. I'm, I'm using the term surplus as the negative of a reduction in out of district tuition, but each year it's somewhere around one three one five million. Okay, now I, I know you applied these to other things, but I'm I'm trying to suggest that there's a trend here. Okay, and, so, and that we we should be thinking about how this fits into the overall strategy of the town. That's what I'm asking for. The, 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 other, the other point you made, you made a point of expenditures dropped from $4 million. Can you point out what you're referring to? Was that in my presentation? Uh, yeah, there was something. Um, may, I, may, I, may I bring up my presentation at this point? Uh, yeah, I have to find it. I, it was slide 14 or 15 or something. But no worries, I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up. I just want to see if you are. It was, okay, on slide 10, I'm sorry, page 10, at least the one that you just sent out, okay? Mm -hmm. 
um, there is a, a $3 million uh, surplus in the special education in fiscal 20, the variance. And in fiscal 19, there was a 1.3. So between those two years, $4 million. Oh, you're referring to, you're doing an added, uh, additive. Well, I'm just saying, yeah, it, it so was 1.3 in fiscal 19 and it's 3.2 in fiscal 20. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 would, I wouldn't, I would not, I would not suggest putting information out as that way. What I would, I would suggest, and I, I try to do my best explaining what happened between the two fiscal years. No, I, Mike, you did. You did a great job. I understand the, the bottom line. Okay, I completely understand the bottom line. I understand yeah. the COVID. I understand the fact that the maintenance budgets went out of whack. Um, those things can be addressed over the longer term, but we can also address what the out of district special education costs are. We can't just every year be putting them someplace else and, and the budget going up indefinitely. I mean, I think that, I think that if, the, if the special education out of district costs were really driving this, then we should be paying it. But if it's not, we shouldn't be. That's the point I'm trying to make. And I'm trying to suggest that, that the, I, I think the school department has a, you know, I realize that all of the pressures on the, on the, on the school committee and on the school department and the demands of the parents. I mean, I, my kids went to the Arlington schools. Um, my grandson was going to the Arlington school. So I know, I know what you're going through, but we also have the taxpayers to think about. So I, I don't want to beat this into the ground. I just made a couple of comments and I'm sorry to have. Um, no, 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 I just, I just wanted you to understand that because your comment, your original comment was, and I wrote it down was special education from FY19 to FY20 dropped $4 million. And if other people are watching and those that are listening today, they would understand that the expenditures would have been $4 million less between the two years. No, I mean, I, that's I, actually the not two variances, the two surpluses added up to $4 million over the two years. Yes, that's, that's what you meant. That's why I was just trying to clarify. Okay. And then the other thing is I want to just want to make sure you, you understand is the, um, the COVID, the COVID related grants and Jane explained it pretty clearly um, in terms of the turn back of what's sitting on the general fund. The, the interesting thing is as over time, the municipal funds and, and there were um, the FEMA related funds as well, some of the, what they would approve as expenses to be claimed changed. And, but all, and what didn't change was that the municipal care funds could not cover costs such as teacher salaries and whatnot. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education only gave us a, a limited amount of money and we blew through that money with the additional positions that we needed to hire to run the programs this year. Um, so, in the 900,000, there were some salaries that are not gonna be eligible. Then the, the, there are some testing costs that might be eligible or will likely be eligible um, and will be reimbursed at a particular percentage rate. And those are the costs that uh, I'm referring to um, that will we'll claim and then will be turned back to the general fund. Um, there are some costs that are tied to cleaning supplies. Mid and midway through the process, that they did change what was eligible, and a lot of those cleaning supplies are not going to be uh, covered fully at seventy-five percent. Um, so we'll be in a lesser rate of reimbursement for those those cleaning supplies. That's not the control of the the town of Arlington or the school the school committee or the school department. That was beyond our control. So um, we, that's what I was trying to explain in that that COVID slide. If you look um, back to the total expenditures, we've spent $3.6 million towards COVID and FY21 alone. And of that was 900,000 to a million on that general fund. And so um, I if, hope that- If you could, if you could, there, let me make a, another request if I might. Yeah. Could you provide for the finance committee a sort of a COVID accounting, okay? Your COVID expenses, and then all of the income sources that, uh, the extraordinary income sources that uh, whether it's CARES Act or the, through the town or the school or grants or whatever, so that we can have an understanding of how those funds flow, okay? Because I believe this town should also be paying you some additional funds 
out of, out of their distribution channel of um, the CARES Act. Well, if I could, if you can let me share my screen one more time so I can kind of show that. And if you're looking for a more detailed report than beyond the, what I've provided, I think what that, that, that uh, slide does provide what you're asking from the highest level view. Um, and it shows the different funding sources. Maybe I didn't clarify that, um, but it, if you go back to the slide, it, it does uh, show that mainly we currently have the town funds, and then we have what the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, through their CARES distribution of funds, uh, we've received. So we've received, um, we recently, recently received a, a random payment from the department for extra funds to deal with COVID. All schools would receive the two payments. Um, that was about $100,000. Um, but before that, we got $1.3 million um, for the CVRF, which was mainly used to reopen schools. We got a per pupil allocation based on October 1 numbers of, uh, I, I forget the exact number at this, at this moment in terms of the per pupil but number. But Mike, if you could just provide us just just a spreadsheet or something with some of the details, that would be very helpful. Okay. And the yeah. second thing is, uh, I, I am very interested in knowing precisely, let's say for 18, 19, 20, and 21, what the out of district tuition is during the year. In other words, assume that you had to pay every month an invoice to cover the tuition costs. So ignore money coming over from last year and ignore encumbrances from the for the next year. Just what are the out of district services charging the town during each of those years? That's that's that would be some very interesting information. Um, and I'll provide that with the updated presentation. I, I did tell uh, Al earlier when he asked the question that 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 was in that slide and it does tell you the amounts per year from 2008 to 2019. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for tolerating my questions. No, no, if they were if they could be classified as questions as opposed to accusations or something like that. So but I I uh so are there any other questions from the committee uh for the school department? So um Mike, I want to thank you for, for and Kathy for a really good, really there good presentation. Are some, there are some questions, Charlie. I think that uh, Dean, uh, I'm sorry, with it, whose question? There are some hands up, Charlie. Okay, Alan, Al, Al, go ahead. Okay. I kept loose that screen. Michael, don't worry about putting up with him. We have to do it for the whole year, and we've survived. <laughs> uh, do you, on the special ed reserve, you mentioned that you have. At the current time, about six hundred and fifty to seven hundred thousand. Um, do you have a goal in mind? In other words, and this might be a broader than just for the uh, for uh, you, Michael. But uh, do you have a goal in mind? What do you think would be an adequate uh, special special education reserve fund to have? That's a good question. Um, I think Kathy might know the answer a little better than what she would feel comfortable as a superintendent. What I would say is that uh, a good stabilization amount for special ed would probably be closer to $2 million and it shouldn't go above that amount. But I would, I would uh, heed to Kathy, Kathy to, to provide what she believes. Yeah. I, I, I would concur. We actually have been asking ourselves that question as well, Al. And looking to other places what they what they do and with their the reserve account um but i think that that is um cl very close to where we should be where we are right now you know it, 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 if we have one residential and maybe one or two out of district that we did not budget for that would be it in fact it would not even be enough so that <laughs> That's a question we are looking into, but I would concur this probably, it's certainly more than we have, and it's certainly more than a million, but I think a million at a baseline would be um, the minimum we should go at. Okay, thank you. And 
Uh, um, I, I know we're only three quarters of the way through the year, uh, and uh, but you know, projecting ahead, uh, I think part of what Charlie was saying is we'd really appreciate the talent appreciate uh, you, you know looking to return any funds not used above what you think you need to make the next step in the special education reserve. Uh, you, you stepped up last June uh, with about 460,000 uh, and depending on circumstances, especially of course, nobody exactly knows what the federal funds are gonna be allowed to be used for, uh, but, but funds returned to free cash would certainly be appreciated. So uh, again, thank you for your presentation, appreciate it. Alan Jones. I know, uh, well, going back to the special ed reserve, it seems like there's a there's mathematics that can be applied to that, like we do snow and ice, basically. But <laughs> had more of a, a meta comment related to the override of special education and other numbers. If I was a skeptical taxpayer watching this meeting and I heard Charlie say three percent, and I heard Kiersey say seven percent, and I hear Annie say nine percent, I'd say you people don't know what you're doing. Yeah, you know, I'd. I'd, I'd we need to be transparent and credible. So I, I don't want to let that slide. I think we need to resolve that, you know, between 3% and 9%. What's the real number? And maybe there are other numbers we need to do the same thing for. What, what, that's my I, comment. I'm sorry, but Alan, what, what do you mean? This was an analysis that was done in like 2011 and was available to Long Range Planning Committee. We talked about it at like four meetings. Okay, well, 2011 is probably, you know, maybe irrelevant at this point. I, I just want well, us to, to, to use the same how, number. That's all. That was how we set the 7% parameter. Okay. I'm just saying that 7% parameter okay. yeah. is set on yeah. real data. Yeah. yeah. I'm only saying we need transparency and credibility, and it'd be nice if we all use the same numbers and we could work that out. Thank you. Any other questions? Dean, um, you're going to make some comments. I am going to make some comments. Um, and I'm going to read them because very rarely I don't want to screw it up. Um, as many of you know, this is Dr. Bodhi's last budget presentation before the Finance Committee, as she will be retiring at the end of the school year. In recognition of her many years of service, I felt that it was important to conclude our budget hearing by recognizing Dr. Bodhi for her many years of distinguished service and leadership to the Arlington Public Schools. Dr. Bodhi is without question one of, if not the most consequential superintendent in the town's history. Her accomplishments are numerous, but tonight I will limit my remarks to four. The first accomplishment I will, hi I will highlight is when Dr. Brody started in the system. She faced a school committee that was deeply divided, a teacher's union and teachers that were at odds with the administration in a community that seemed to be breaking at the seams. I don't want to spend a lot of time dwelling on, time dwelling on this, but I will summarize the climate at the time by reminding everyone that Dr. Bodhi took charge of the district when her predecessor resigned, effective immediately after walking out of an arbitration hearing for a personnel decision he initiated. Through her soft-spoken demeanor and collaborative leadership style, the bitter divide in this community, on the school committee, and with our teachers quickly went away. Today's school committee is highly functional and collaborative. The relationship between administration and teachers is constructive, and policy differences are handled professionally and collaboratively. Accomplishment number two is school enrollment growth. Dr. Bodie assumed the role of superintendent with a rising school enrollment that was straining the school's operating budget. Again, through collaborative her collaborative leadership style, Dr. Bodie worked with the town manager and other stakeholders to come up with a funding formula, which we call the net new student or the per, net per pupil formula, which was first 25%, then 50%. Accomplishment number three, Dr. Bodie has proven to be the most prolific construction manager in the history of this town. When she first took over as superintendent, we had rebuilt five of our seven elementary schools, but had two stuck, the Thompson and the Stratton. Dr. Bodie worked with the town and capital planning committee to come up with a short-term plan to invest in those schools while we waited for a larger strategy. She then worked with the same, same stakeholders to successfully achieve MSBA funding for the Thompson School and work with the capital planning committee to get the Stratton rebuilt. When school enrollment growth, several years later, when school enrollment growth stressed our collective school capacity beyond belief, Dr. Bodhi co-chaired the school enrollment task force that led to the rebuild and reopening of the Gibbs sixth grade only school, and in addition to the Thompson. Finally, on the capital front, from 2017 through 2019, Dr. Bodhi helped lead the process 
that culminated in the town fulfilling the promise it first made to the voters in the 1970s that it would rebuild Arlington High School. And lastly, I would highlight Dr. what I believe to be Dr. Rohde's fourth big accomplishment, leaving this district in great shape. If you've ever had the pleasure of working with Mr. Mason, Dr. McNeil, the principals and district administrators, you quickly realize that Dr. Bodie likes hiring talented people. This was best exemplified in the search that led to the selection of our next superintendent, Dr. Holman. The search process was focused on maintaining the gains of the last decade and how to take the district even higher. There was no bitterness. There was no anxiety that this district was at a tipping point or that we needed to solve a major problem. The search, which was tasked, the school committee was tasked to accomplish, was a luxury of going from great to even greater. That is the true testament to Dr. Bodie's leadership over the last 10 years and her many accomplishments. I will end my remarks with a res by making a resolution, uh, moving a motion for the committee, and it reads as follows. Resolved that the Arlington Finance Committee thanks Dr. Kathleen Bodie for her many years of dedicated service to the Arlington School Com to the Arlington Public Schools, that the committee recognizes her numerous accomplishments as superintendent that have led to a stronger school system, and that the committee wishes her well in her retirement. Thank you. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> and, and to Jean, thank you very much. When you actually put all of those together, um, I think about it, I go, at each time there was, uh, that was pretty much a big focus and we have accomplished a lot together. Um, I think I think all of you, the, the kind of service you give, the Arlington community has been so supportive of our schools and I, I, I wanna recognize that. Um, this would not, these buildings would not have happened without that kind of support. And there's a lot to be proud of as a community. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I have a great team. And that's actually one of the most important jobs I have is to make sure that the leadership uh, in a district is have the right people with the right priorities, values, and competency so that we do improve. Because ultimately, as we all know, this is all about the children. And if we can say that we're doing our very best to help them grow, and be as to reach their potential, um, then we've accomplished a lot. But we also want them to do it in a, in a good environment. And I think I think we're pretty good. I I, I watched that high school go up outside my window, and um, I, I wish I could be here to see more of it go up. But um, I will be certainly watching it closely through the website and driving by just to see where it where it is. But it's going to be a great um, going to be a great school. But anyway, I, I appreciate you recognizing all of these things. And I, I, my heartfelt thank you to all of you for your support over the years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. So um, I think that brings our meeting to an end. We're past the, uh, the magic hour of 10 p.m., which uh, uh, is the normal adjournment. So if there are no other questions with, uh, with our thanks to the um, entire school committee and especially to Dr. Bodie um, and Mike Mason, uh, there's a motion to adjourn would be in order. I'll move. I'll move. Second. There a second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, are there any objections? Hearing no objections, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Kathy. Alan has a question. <laughs> Alan, Alan Toss. Hands up. Thanks, everyone. Good night. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> I, think, I think it was a mistake. <laughs> Good night. Okay. Thank you.